Well, Vache, thanks for joining us for this interview. It's a new series that we're trying to offer. We call this Ministry of Future Affairs. And the idea is just to have a discussion and, and have our audience get to know people in a different dimension than they would in formal interviews. So this is meant very much to be informal, conversational, and thanks for accepting our invitation. Thank you for hosting me. Super. So uh, I want to start out a little bit on the personal side and take you back to your teenage years and have you describe to the listeners uh, what, how, you, how you would describe yourself when you were a teenager, what interests did you have, you know, what was life like in Armenia when you were growing up? Oh, I would say I was a regular Soviet kid. Uh, although I was not very much a kind of athlete, I was more of a geek type and a uh, guy who studied much more than was actively engaged. At the same time, it was not uh, completely that. Uh, since I was relatively tall, for example, I was on school basketball team. I was not athletic, but I was tall. I could grab balls or something <laughs> like that. So there was some use for me. So uh, I was playing in the uh, yard or uh, whatever you call it, on street. Uh, so I would say most of the time regular. And then uh, uh, and the student years coincided with something called perestroika and then collapse of the Soviet Union. So it was uh, much more interesting if you are having a backward look because uh, there are events that usually don't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so from this perspective, uh, I've seen a collapsing country ideology and many other things coming together. And as a student, uh, you are always thinking about change without thinking what the change would lead. Mm -hmm. But you are always for that. And I graduated uh, university in 1990 and 1991, Soviet Union collapsed. So it was the mm -hmm. these years that mm -hmm. perhaps formed me. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, how... How did you decide what to study? What were your interests at the time? And did they change after? Oh, it was interesting. Uh, I always had kind of, uh, not natural sciences, but mathematical inclinations. And I also liked uh, literature, arts, etc. My both parents are professors of literature. So I had enough of upbringing on that matter. And I knew very well because uh, even if you don't want to, you are exposed to it because that's what they are talking about. But at the end of the day, I decided uh, somewhere in between uh, because it was not pure science, uh, as we understand the natural sciences, and it was not uh, pure humanities. It was social sciences. Mm -hmm. But it was a very uh, strange discipline. Uh, I got into a department in the university, or as we call them, faculties, it's called economic cybernetics. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a very interesting, odd name to it because uh, to most of the Westerners it doesn't exist because it was whatever is called economics. But in Soviet Union, the economics discipline was something else. It was Marxist grounded. Mm -hmm. So in order to get used uh, of mathematics, understanding prices, etc., there was this mimicry. And you were using mathematics, uh, well for example, uh, instead of saying utility, you were saying uh, derivative of a function. Uh, but that's the only way, because otherwise you would go against the Marxist ideology. So this is a form of socialist realism. Uh, so kind of it's just like what they did to art, right? You had to be... <laughs> you had to be because, uh, for example, more or less, uh, we have a good picture uh, paintings from that time that you have a uh, gorgeous landscape, but in order for that landscape to pass, mm -hmm. they had to put a peasant somewhere in the middle exactly. it's about the people. Uh, in, in order to say this is not about the landscape alone, this is about uh, heroic labor of our socialist exactly. laborers. That's, what I mean. yeah, exactly. That's exactly, exactly the same logic. So uh, we, uh, I graduated that, and uh, it was in the middle, mm -hmm. uh, kind of neither this or that, uh, yeah. but ever since then I found that whatever I was studying was uh, dear to my heart because 
uh, it is something that interests me, uh, what people do. And uh, at the same time, uh, I'm not into too much interpretive part of it. Mm -hmm. Kind of, I think because of this and that, I have these feelings or that, there is some type of logic as well and you can derive that logic. So from this perspective, uh, if you are thinking about economics and uh, later, I got into public administration and it's what makes people tick and what they do and why they do it and how they behave it. So let, let's go back to that period. You were, you were uh, at a very early age, a part of, uh, started to serve in the Armenian parliament, as I understand it, at 22, 23 years old. What drove you in that direction and what were you doing? Oh, I was a staff member, I was not a politician. Right, so right. <laughs> Uh, it was a uh, revolutionary time and it uh, suddenly there appeared uh, to me a new type of setting, a new type of parliament that we never had. <coughs> uh, people don't, may, may not know that in Soviet Union we didn't have a professional parliament. In Soviet Union we had Supreme Council and Supreme Council was not a fully functioning body. It was um, semi-professional. I would say, and it was very representative. Uh, uh, there was a quota system. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to have a milkmaid, uh, you have to have an uh, academician, you have to have an um, uh, architect, etc., uh, on different regions, etc. Very robust quota system. They would convene twice a year, and uh, there were resolutions prepared by the Communist Party, and they would ratify it and go back. Suddenly, in the prehistoric years, they said, okay, now we are going to have a full-time legislature. And this was news, but it was still happening in Moscow, and it didn't translate yet into Armenia. In 1990, uh, we declared independence, uh, all the Soviet Union was still alive. In 1991, uh, Soviet Union collapsed, and uh, parliament in that period, in this Soviet Union still in the process of collapsing, Armenian nation uh, institutes are beginning to evolve. We had uh, elections in 1990 and we uh, formed a parliament and this far parliament said, okay, we are going to have committees. Mm -hmm. And for these committees, there were uh, people needed to be aides. Uh, staff member was uh, basically uh, the job and uh, Ignaz Sarkisyan, who later was the Prime Minister of Armenia, uh, uh, picked me up because he asked about the professor, who is a good learner, etc. And I was excelling academically. And I also knew English. I could read other literature, uh, not very much available, but still whatever came around, I could read and understand, etc. So I appeared in the parliament and started to help with uh, working on legislation. Now you then you followed you, you did some years in the U.S. right? Tell I us about that. I did masters and then I did PhD and uh, both in public administration. Mm -hmm. And again, public administration was uh, well. We, we have to again understand the differences, the nuances of the educational differences in the United States and here don't exist. For example. Uh, we have Master of Science and Master of Arts. In Armenia, uh, people don't differentiate between science and art. Mm -hmm. If you are taking, you are saying, okay, you, you are masters, magister. It is uh, wonderful, but uh, you may, may be, for example, in economics, you can have Master of Arts in economics and Master of Science in economics. In Armenia, it doesn't exist. So in public administration this way, uh, the discipline doesn't exist the way it exists in the United States mm -hmm. because in the United States is a professional field like the MBA. Mm -hmm. It's not science. It is a field where you apply different sciences. Yeah. So again, this was fitting in my understanding uh, of social mm -hmm. sphere and social science, uh, trying to understand what to do and how to get it, especially after my um, exposure to the parliament and seeing uh, how laws are made and not truly scientific <laughs> <laughs> endeavor. And uh, you are asking questions, okay, how things, how to get things done. 
and uh, economics per se if it is something just for pure uh, ivory tower issues I am not interested. I am interested in getting things done so from this perspective it was a, a very welcome eye-opening experience mm. as well. So and, and how did you, how did the cultural, the way people live difference strike you when you went to the US to study? That must have been a pretty big difference at the time. Initially in 1990, even in the Soviet era, I was exposed to US because there was a short period of time. I attended a college course, so I've already been exposed, but of course it was different. It was much more democratic and it was much more open I, in terms of thinking. And it was a uh, much lower uh, power difference. Uh, there is distance in international management studies uh, coined by Dutch scientists of study. It's kind of how do you perceive the difference. In the US, for example, they are co uh, calling a professor by his first name and this is what he expects. Mm -hmm. In here, there is several layers of deference. Um, you are saying, oh professor, oh kind of, yeah. that was the logic. And Russian-German type of controlled hierarchy type of system. These were things that you had to overcome because you initially, it took me years to call, for example, the professor who went to my work within the United States by name because uh, mm -hmm. I couldn't do it immediately, mm -hmm. but I did it. Very good. So then just, just to wrap up, kind of come back to the career part. So you came back and, and what was your career trajectory then? I came back and I started to teach because after PhD, you understand that most of the time you have to teach. And uh, when I was also in school, they said, if you just want to work, masters is enough. But if you also think about teaching, uh, you better have a PhD. And while you are doing PhD, you are teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, you are teaching assistant, etc. So I was teaching at university uh, for all the subjects that people went on sabbatical. So I had good exposure of teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came, I started to uh, lecture at Yerevan State mm -hmm. immediately. Then I uh, was called upon again by Tigran Sarkisian, who was at the time chairman of the Central Bank. And I started my career in the Central Bank uh, simultaneously teaching. I never gave up teaching. So mm -hmm. since 1999, I was also teaching at this AUA, American University of Armenia. And I still continue. I taught at Yerevan State for about 12 years. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of the simultaneous track in my life that I always did. Mm. What did you teach? What of the things you've taught are most representative of you? I was teaching at the AUA mostly public administration. Again, I'm just trying to say it's a field about thi getting things done. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, State, I was teaching economics and monetary policy, etc. the things that I was doing at mm -hmm. uh, Central Bank. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So sent you were at the Central Bank for how long? Uh, I was for in the Central Bank for 12 years. 12 years. And maybe just, again, people don't know what it's like to be in the central bank. Give us a, a quick overview of what, th what that's like. If you were describing to your mother or to your neighbor what it is to be a central bank, how would you describe it? Central bank is a very interesting institution because mm, it's the bank of the banks. Mm -hmm. But number <laughs> one, it never gives anybody a loan. So otherwise, it's a perfectly good bank. Yeah. <laughs> It is catering all the rest of the banks and controls the money supply. So how much money is in the country, it's the central bank's function. But our central bank evolved into not only a monetary authority, but also a grand regulator of all the financial sphere. So it's a mega regulator. It is controlling the uh, insurance industry, it is controlling the stock market, it is controlling the banking industry, etc. Mm -hmm. And the reasons it evolved that way, uh, it is because it was the only uh, institution that was functioning more like an institution. Uh, to a certain extent, it was the central bank where they have the money. You know the mm -hmm. 
famous gangster in the United States, Willie Sutton, they said, why you are robbing the banks? He says, because the money is there. Exactly. So uh, most of the central banks around the world, they have a uh, relatively better position and they are more institutionalized because they are printing money at the end of the day and mm -hmm. more or less, most of the time, they are solvent and they are able to attract a uh, better calibre mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of cadres. So uh, uh, central bank is uh, basically uh, controlling the financial system, controlling the money supply and caring about not letting inflation mm -hmm. take hold while not surmounting uh, problems for growth. Uh, because the easiest way to mm, not having inflation is not having growth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can say no money. <laughs> Just yeah. There goes inflation. Uh, yeah. uh, there goes inflation. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Is there a country or others that that you'd say the Armenian Central Bank is is fashioned uh, uh, like? I mean, is there is there, and because there's obviously lots of different flavors of central banks. Were there examples that were used, or is this is it a one-off? No, I think we have uh, we don't have idiosyncratically the same, no. uh, but we have similar banks around the world and because, mm, uh, for example, uh, when the new central bank was being fashioned. Uh, it was not kind of dictated by Washington, but it was helped a lot by the IMF. And IMF at the time was muscling a lot for all the former Soviet Union countries, but it was not only in these countries. Uh, it's a global surveillance system, and there are certain things expected. You have to comply in order to be part of the international monetary system. You have special drawing rights, etc., etc. certain things you have to do. So there was the initial setup. Then uh, uh, after this initial setup, uh, you are trying to take what the regulatory roles and the responsibilities are. Uh, we have also been uh, quite a lot uh, impacted by, for example, the, the Netherlands Bank, because in the World Bank and uh, IMF uh, constituency groups and these big international organizations, we don't have a lot at the table because we are too small mm -hmm. to matter. And we are represented by countries. Uh, for example, in our, con in our group of countries, there is Georgia, Ukraine, uh, Montenegro, Romania, etc., etc. Then uh, developments are also in this regard. Uh, it was initially only the, ne uh, the Netherlands group. Now it's the Netherlands and the Belgium together forming a group representing us. So uh, all of these countries share a lot of uh, resemblances of practices mm -hmm. because they see, they learn, etc. Right. So there are quite a lot like us. Uh, I don't believe there is uh, any exactly like ours, right. Right. but in general <coughs> scheme of mm -hmm. things, uh, we are not unique. Sure. So just to switch topics for a second and kind of look back the last 15, 20 years, in Armenia's development, and you've had a particular view of it, obviously, from a, a central bank advisor standpoint, prime minister's advisor standpoint, etc. What, uh, well, I don't mean advisor, but central bank role. What, what's your evaluation of the development of Armenia in the last 15, 20 years? I know it's a very broad question, but what do you feel like, you know, here's some things that worked, here's some things that haven't worked? Well, if you are looking at things, uh, things are changing, but they were not changing as fast as they need to. And uh, uh, if you uh, abstract yourself from particular parties or developments, let's look at institutions, mm -hmm. whether these institutions are existing or operating, and whether they stood the test of time. Uh, some of them did, some of them not. And particularly, you can talk about them uh, in terms of uh, if there is a revolution. It means uh, not everything was working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, but after revolution, also some things that were working <laughs> are not exactly working. <laughs> it doesn't mean everything has gone wrong. But if you are looking at things, are there uh, rules 
or uh, practices that people uh, would uh, follow regardless of who is in power. Uh, this is the basic test of institutions, because what is institution? Uh, to put very briefly, it's a rule that we follow. Uh, it's not something that is imposed upon us and is by force. But do we believe that this is something is uh, good for our growth, or this is part of our essence? And do we believe that this is true? Mm -hmm. So from this perspective, we have limited success because there are certain things that exist, certain things that uh, are not as good. And uh, this is the thing uh, that I think uh, we have to mm, take into account. I mean, uh, let's go, for example, for higher education. In the higher education, uh, we didn't have too much success mm -hmm. because the educational system is outdated. But at the same time, I cannot tell that it's the Soviet system because there have been too many exposures. Uh, people have been traveling. People have been part of the European uh, wider network. Even if they don't want to, uh, they take approaches. And even they start, uh, even if they do it very formalistically, uh, there are certain things they do, and they have to think about it because they are doing it. Uh, to give you an example of quality assurance. Mm -hmm. Now, when we are talking about quality assurance, what we are talking, we are talking about uh, whether you think about learning systematically, whether you reflect upon that whether there are procedures in place, whether there are reports, whether anybody cares about these reports, which is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Is there an action on based on these reports, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, just the phase that you are producing this report and there are things there, eventually brings to change. Now, the question is that we adopted a lot of formal things, but the, in many cases, uh, we were not very keen on implementing this as fast as we could. Mm -hmm. So that was the most uh, problematic thing. In again, I'll give the educational part. Uh, for example, uh, we are doing students' feedback. Everybody collects them, looks at them, and uh, but takes sporadic action rather than systematic review. Mm -hmm or uh, syllabi analysis. Uh, there is one or two analyzed, but aligning them with changing market needs is not there because there is no market trends analysis. Mm -hmm. And again, it's bits and pieces. It's not like things are designed and implemented. Most of the time, things evolve. And, and so this is just in education, higher education, and. You could say the same about every other sector as well. So if you step back and say you just you've done this for a long time, uh, also from the ministry point of view, just not in central bank, etc. What do you attribute the lack of faster advancement to the way you're, you're, you're describing it, that we're doing some things but not as fast as we could? Is it resource lack? Is it mindset uh, uh, limitations? Is it lack of examples? Is a lack of political will? W what is it? Oh, it's a very difficult question. I'm still trying to answer. <laughs> it's not that I have all the answers for myself. But uh, to a certain extent, it is, uh, when I'm looking across the countries, there are much more like us uh, than success stories. And uh, from this perspective, uh, first of all, uh, society is in flux. Mm -hmm. And if you are looking at a bit broader historical perspective, uh, usually transformation takes much longer period of time. It's still too small period of time to have everything codified and we're not lucky to have confluence of events that would solidify all the positive changes. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you are looking at political structure, a political structure usually reflects 
social structure. Mm -hmm. But social structure is in flux and it is not only a problem of changing society that Soviet Union was and turned into Armenia and it is economic change, political change, uh, national change, borders, etc. <coughs> it is also the nature of work changes. Mm -hmm. And we are not anymore in big conglomerates uh, with uh, a million people working in them. Mm -hmm. And it's much smaller companies. Uh, there are a lot of people, uh, my students, current generation, they don't imagine working in one place. My father's generation couldn't imagine uh, not being in one place. Exactly, going to more than one place. Yeah. And it is kind of, you got into here, uh, it's kind of a given, because especially if it's Soviet type of thing, uh, it's forever. It's a yeah. state institution you get into, yeah. You learn your life, you are becoming this, and you are basically becoming a company person or whatever. Uh, currently, if you are asking students, they are saying, no, no, I'm not going to stick in one place. We'll forget about it. I'm going to change. I'm going to look for newer things, etc. Uh, there are things who are uh, people who are getting into gig work, and they are saying, I don't want to have a full-time employment. Thank you. I'm working. I have engagement, multiple engagement. Uh, authors in California are, of course, with a lot of support from Uber and uh, Lyft and many others are saying that they are not taxi drivers, they are independent contractors. And it's on ballot. And again, uh, with a lot of money and other mm, resources poured in by uh, big corporations. But they are saying we are gig workers. Mm -hmm. So this is changing. And because the society was in much larger turmoil, we didn't have the solidified resources in order to consolidate and get forward. And uh, this is uh, the most important thing to understand is, uh, if you are talking about historical larger sweep, why didn't it work? Because uh, very often uh, the biggest revelation that people are getting in power, uh, they are as soon as they get power, they understand that power is much more limited than it is appears from outside. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, power, power doesn't translate into action. Yes. It's just, it's, a, it's, it's static power, it's not kinetic power that you can't force actions. So just, just to kind of go from there, I, you know, what we worked together for many years in the context of this National Competitiveness Foundation. And, you know, as you know, some of the things that we've tried to work on over the years has been thinking about the future, thinking about choosing certain strategies that might help the country, etc. And over those years, at least for me, that has really uh, juxtaposed the, the present against the future or the future against the present. And I'm curious how you think about the role of time and, 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 the, and the influence of the future on present actions or vice versa as part of strategy, as part of, you know, so for example, if you say, look, the forces that are shaping society and changing it is so large that it's like being drawn, you know, into a stream that's running, whether you put your hand up or your foot out, it doesn't matter, the stream's gonna carry you, and therefore, what future? It'll be what it'll be. Alternatively, you could say, okay, if the, if the waters are a little more calm and I actually wanna go there to get off the water into the bank, I gotta do X, Y, Z. So how, do you, how have you, over time, um, developed a relationship between these two ideas of present-centric action, future-centric action, a balance? It's an extremely hard question, but uh, the most important thing is if you are able to make priorities. And uh, if you believe in something uh, and have a sense of urgency, you are saying, okay, if I don't do this, I'm going to permanently lose. I'm going to have a loss that is non-recoverable. Mm -hmm. So for this reason, uh, I have to understand that this is preference and preference and this is urgent. And on all the matters that we really believed as a society or as the powers to be, mm, at different times, different people, uh, really believed in urgency, we get, got the things done. Uh, this is the, I think, most important thing. 
do we feel urgency or not? And uh, I think the hardest thing in the government is everybody has a claim and it is extremely difficult if you are especially in a populist political mode and currently social media everybody is being pushed to be populist and I'm not talking about particular people. I'm talking about social media influence. Uh, in this case, it is very difficult to make preferences because uh, suddenly it's not something the media you control. It's uh, opposition comes from all, ad, all the possible corners and it takes a lot of resources and it is making very difficult for you to uh, focus on say this is urgent and this is number one thing that we are going to do. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, at some level, you're saying that the future is not popular. The present is, is heterogeneous, but at least the populace en enters the fray. And so either way, you're kind of challenged, right? Because the problem about the future is that you don't really know what people want, what people will want, because it's too far off. The problem with the present is that people want everything and they don't now. agree on what they want now. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a real struggle. Let me, let me kind of take, take us to a couple of other topics because we're going to run out of time. It's a great discussion. Um, talk, talk a little bit about um, Armenia as in its, not only in its geopolitical setting, but also the special situation of Armenia having such a diaspora and, you know, all the ways in which over the years, you know, we've made attempts to try to get some level of interaction with the diaspora, etc. From a social science, economic, you know, developmental standpoint, What's been your mental model of what, what role, if any, the diaspora should play, can play in development? I'm not talking about charity, I'm not talking about tourism, etc. Is there such a role in your vision of, of the country? Oh, definitely there is a role in diaspora, but uh, the question is, I think the, one of the wrong things is to think about diaspora as one thing. Mm -hmm. Diaspora is uh, political scientists use the term called polity mm -hmm. uh, and it's not an entity <laughs> uh, that you can touch, uh, talk uh, or uh, negotiate with. Mm -hmm. uh, diaspora cannot have representation, diaspora cannot do this. So from this perspective, I think the most useful way of thinking diaspora is of diaspora is uh, people of oneness with you, but with different uh, levels of allegiance to different ideas. And I'm not talking about different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, because culturally they are also different. And uh, culturally different, I don't mean uh, yeah. uh, language-wise. I mean social mores, uh, preferences, uh, priorities, and many other things that are in different communities around the world. So if you are thinking that uh, this is diaspora, I have to deal with diaspora, most of the time I think you are going to fail because diaspora is too diverse to deal with one mode. Mm -hmm. But if you think that there is diaspora and there are a lot of people uh, with desires like yours, with shared beliefs like yours, and on particular topics and particular strata, and particular ideas, you can collaborate with a lot of them, this is going to bring a lot of resources to you. Because uh, in that case, uh, you are also heading off intra-diaspora <laughs> debates. Who is diaspora, who is not, who is going to represent, is this church or the other church, <laughs> is this party or the other party. So you have to think about modes of cooperating with diaspora people uh, compatriots who have the same passion for the country with, as you are, but you don't have to think that you just put the checkbox and uh, this is the one mode I'm dealing with diaspora. You may deal with diaspora doctors in one way, diaspora politicians in another way, diaspora teachers in another way, etc. Diaspora is too diverse to be dealt with one mode. Cool, very good answer. So then the other uniqueness of the moment we're in is, you know, 
Russia-Ukraine war, you know, this threat of infl massive inflation, you know, food insecurity propping up everywhere, democracies being challenged as to kind of in, in their most extreme, extremely divided states, you know, across the, across the world. We're seeing Prime Minister of England resigning yesterday. The U.S. political situation is, is a complete, complete mess. Uh, and so, you know, it's probably been, this is about as turbulent, at least in my adult life, as I've seen. You've lived through lots of uh, uh, other challenges with the Soviet Union changing, but at least it was not a global kind of, let alone pandemic, let alone persistent health challenges and waves after waves, let alone the looming climate change, if we can just record the, the top 10 things of the period. So how, how to think about all that as a, a in within kind of the Armenian the, the boat that's called Armenia that we're that we're in one way or the other and and what's your view of the context uh, that we're living in? Uh, it's a very interesting one. Um, see, when from public administration point, I was looking at, for example, what you should ask uh, from. Uh, a uh, firefighter. Well, what should the KPI be? Mm -hmm. uh, the more fires and they are fighting the fires, is it better? No. Lack of fires? And no, because it's not a control, and it's not something they control. So at the end of the day, you understand that if there is uh, turbulence, the only thing you have to uh, take care is about your capacity. Are you able to deal with situation? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, army is not something uh, we are thinking about in terms of conquering or not conquering. Army is a capacity to solve a problem when it arises. And uh, you're lucky that you don't have war, but uh, it doesn't mean you don't have to be have drills. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, pandemic mm -hmm. exposed that we have great problem with public health. Mm -hmm. uh, things like modern Pfizer vaccines, etc. It appears, for example, that uh, we didn't have the capacity in Armenia for a cold chain. There is a vaccine that we, uh, if even if it was available, we couldn't bring in because we just couldn't handle it. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have uh, the capacity of mass organizations of uh, testing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all of these things is uh, talking about one thing: what is our capacity to have capacity deployed? at a short period of time. Are we able to mobilize and mm -hmm. address the question head on and what is our uh, time to deal with it? Mm -hmm. So to me, essentially it boils down to that. Do we have institutions that are able to mobilize in a short period of time? Mm -hmm. And do we have the routines? Are we drilling all the time? Andrew Grove has these words uh, about semiconductor industry, only the paranoid survive. As a society, we don't feel urgency. And this is, I think, the largest problem we have. And then just while we're at it, I, I don't want to pile on some big questions, but just to your sentiment. You know, obviously, with this multipolar world, you now have a, a more uh, conflicted Russian pole that we're part of a European emerging poll and then a US poll and maybe a you know a different poll yet emerging from the east within that where do you see armenia in the next 5 10 15 years that center shifting in one direction or the other uh, i wouldn't bet on anyone <coughs> taking precedence takitus the Roman historian uh, has this word about Armenians. 
I don't remember the exact word, but uh, sometimes uh, it's translated that uh, uh, they are contradictory. Sometimes it's translated that uh, 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 they are don't cling to one view, and uh, they have uh, kind of multiple senses or whatever. But it is coming with centuries. The place is like that, that we are on a tectonic plate. Mm -hmm. Sticking to one uh, I don't think is going to do much mm -hmm. good to us. So we have to find a way to be understood by and understand and be relevant to different parties so that we don't find ourselves overly reliant on one or the other. Uh, absolutely. Over-reliance is going to kill us. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand in the particular context who has more interest in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for some, uh, the region is interested for the dominance. For some, the region is interested to deter others' dominance, but not to get engaged. Mm -hmm. And from this perspective, uh, uh, we have to weigh on uh, what our interests are, uh, engage with everybody. At the same time, uh, historically, there have been a lot of our effort and drive towards European ideals. But Europe proved to be too far mm -hmm. to have a significant impact. Mm -hmm. What is good to learn from European institutions and borrow practices. But uh, you cannot have all your eggs in one basket. Very interesting. Final, final question, which also won't be easy, but it'll be a good thing, good challenge for you. So, you know, all of us are a balance between pessimism and optimism, and at a given time we deviate, some violently between the two, some just a little bit between the two. My question to you is, when you're optimistic w about the future, what's the source of the optimism? And what's the top source of the optimism? And when you're pessimistic about the future, what's the main source of your pessimism? Like if there's one standout driver that if you feel if you feel optimistic, it's, it's about this, and if you feel pessimistic, it's about that. Well, yeah, there is a saying that pessimists are better informed optimists. <laughs> Here you go, that's one answer. <laughs> so the answer is, uh, when you get information is what is happening <laughs> and why it's happening, it's the source of your <laughs> pessimism. And uh, the source of optimism, if you are dealing with uh, younger ones, you see that there is a lot of potential over there. Mm -hmm. And there is a hope that some of them are going to do uh, much better than you uh, and solve problems that you were unable to solve. When I say you, I don't mean personally. I mean my generation mm -hmm. kind yeah. of things. So, so you're saying basically, if I can rephrase it, your source of pessimism is certain people and your source of optimism is other people. <laughs> ah, you can always can tell it. The younger people are sort of a source of optimism. Yeah. Although you always lament that uh, you were reading more, you were more curious, etc., etc. There is this uh, yeah. age-old coming from the first instances from Egypt, ancient Egypt, uh, mm -hmm. lamenting the younger generation. But still, the source of optimism is that. Source of pessimism is not people. It's about information. It, you really know exactly how it happened and why it happened and how mm -hmm. stupid it was. Mm. Excellent. Well. On that front, thanks for sharing your thoughts. It's been very exciting, and thanks for joining this program. Thank you. Thank you.